Newfoundlanders and Labradorians were on the move in the 1890s. In that decade, a new Trans Island Railway opened, the SS Bruce started regular ferry runs between the island and mainland North America, and a fleet of coastal steamers carried passengers between local ports. Travel to, from, and within the colony was easier than ever before. The foundation was laid for a brand new industry, tourism. The government saw it as a way to diversify the economy and create jobs in rural areas. It also hoped to introduce Newfoundland and Labrador to wealthy entrepreneurs who might invest in local business and industry. Another early promoter of the tourism industry was the Reed Newfoundland Company, the same company that owned the railway, the SS Bruce, and the coastal steamer service. It published some of the colony's first tourism guides and brochures. Many targeted wealthy anglers and hunters by publicizing the island's salmon rivers and hunting grounds, which were usually in areas that the railway had made newly accessible. Two other groups of tourists were also targeted, middle-class city dwellers hoping to reconnect with nature and homesick expatriates living in the United States and Canada. The colony's promotional materials catered to all three groups by focusing on its majestic scenery, picturesque fishing villages, and abundant wildlife. And just in case prospective tourists had never heard of Newfoundland and Labrador, a frame of reference was given. It was touted as the Norway of the New World. It also bore a striking resemblance to the Highlands of Scotland. Both were high-profile destinations known for their remoteness and wild landscapes, the same image Newfoundland and Labrador was creating for itself. When it came to tempting expats back for a visit, nature was joined by another powerful marketing tool, nostalgia. Newfoundland and Labrador was depicted as a place frozen in time where homesick adults could reconnect with their childhoods. And they weren't just invited back for family vacations. The occasional large-scale group reunion was also organized. One of the earliest took place in 1904. Old Home Week drew hundreds of expatriates back for a visit. Common to all tourism campaigns was a simplified and idealistic vision of Newfoundland and Labrador. The colony was depicted as a place outside of social, political, and economic strife. It was a scenic paradise, unspoiled by litter or industrial development. The outport people were hospitable, simple, and open. They might be poor, but they were happy with their place in the world. Historian James Overton suggests that tourism campaigns did more than attract tourists and their dollars to the colony. They also helped to define the Newfoundland and Labrador people and shape its cultural heritage. A particular version of Newfoundland was invented for tourists, but it was not invented just for tourists. The same totems, icons, and images highlighted for tourists came to be seen as the essential symbols of Newfoundland national identity. Newfoundland and Labrador's underdevelopment was central to its advertising campaigns, but it also obstructed tourism. Visitors wanted to be close to nature and experience a rustic lifestyle, but they also wanted modern amenities. To this end, more and larger hotels opened on the island in the early decades of the 20th century. The largest was the Hotel Newfoundland, which opened at St. John's in 1926. By the 1930s, other large hotels were operating elsewhere on the island, including the Glen Mill Inn at Corner Brook, Glen Eagles Lodge near Gander Lake, and the Beach Grove Hotel at Spaniards Bay. But government and business still struggled to provide tourists with other amenities they expected. Among them was a reliable network of roads. This became especially problematic in the 1940s and 50s when a new kind of vacation grew in popularity, the road trip. 
Cars were more widespread than ever before, and more and more families were using them for vacations and leisure trips. Developing the infrastructure that would attract the modern tourist became a central focus of Joseph Smallwood's liberal government in the immediate post-Confederation period. Joseph Smallwood was the premier of Newfoundland and Labrador from 1949 until 1971. Like his pre-Confederation counterparts, he embraced the tourism industry as a way to diversify the economy, create jobs in outport communities, and introduce the province to potential investors. But he also recognized that extensive improvements were desperately needed in transportation and accommodations. As a result, the province embarked on a program of modernization before promoting itself to tourists. It identified three main goals. First, there was a pressing need to develop the infrastructure of the tourism industry. Improved road, ferry, and air transport were vital. So were better accommodations, food services, entertainment, parklands, marked historic sites, and other attractions. Second, an effective advertising campaign would have to be developed to entice travelers. And third, the government wanted to nurture what it called a tourist consciousness among local residents. To this end, educational campaigns promoted the economic value of the industry and even provided training in how to treat tourists. The province invested heavily in tourism, with help from federal funds and programs. It passed the Provincial Parks Act in 1952, and two years later opened the Sir Richard Squires Memorial Park near Deer Lake. Other provincial parks soon followed. Terra Nova became the province's first national park in 1957. And one year later, Signal Hill became its first national historic park. Cape Spear followed suit in 1962. An important milestone was the extension of the Trans-Canada Highway across the island of Newfoundland in 1965. One year later, the province launched a tourism campaign to celebrate the new highway. Come Home Year targeted expats and their descendants. The government was key in organizing the event. It chartered an additional ferry for the Nova Scotia to Porta Bass crossing and produced an array of promotional materials. Come Home Year signaled the start of Newfoundland and Labrador's new tourist development program. An unparalleled success, the event earned about $45 million in direct revenues and laid the groundwork for future advertising campaigns. Newfoundland and Labrador was touted as a place where travelers could enjoy modern conveniences and still connect with nature, enjoy a simpler way of life, and experience a unique outport culture. Tourism continued to grow in the coming years with help from federal funds. Lanceau Meadows was designated a National Historic Site of Canada in 1968, followed by Portachois in 1970. That same year, an agreement was signed to establish Gross Morn National Park on the west coast of Newfoundland. On Labrador's southeast coast, archaeological work was attracting tourists to the fishing village of Red Bay. It had been a hub for Basque whalers during the 16th century. In 1979, it became a National Historic Site of Canada. Some communities that had been resettled were also repackaged as tourist attractions. Among them was Battle Harbor. In the 1980s and 90s, heritage carpenters restored 22 of the fishing village's buildings. Some of them dated back to the 1700s. Battle Harbor was designated a National Historic Site of Canada in 1997. That was the same year the province launched a large tourism event to mark the 500th anniversary of John Cabot's arrival at North America. The anniversary is no longer considered an occasion for unreflective celebration, but three decades ago the government invested heavily in the event. Queen Elizabeth visited the province and a replica of Cabot's ship sailed from Bristol, England to Newfoundland and Labrador. The province estimated that 69,000 visitors injected $51 million into the local economy. 
The American Automobile Association even named Cabot 500 as North America's most important tourist event in 1997. The government supported other large-scale cultural events in the coming years, too. These included the 50th anniversary of Confederation in 1999 and the Viking Millennium in 2000. Labrador tourism received a boost in 2005 when Parks Canada established the Torn Gat Mountains National Park. Since the very beginning of the tourism industry in the 1890s, marketing has played a central role in its success. The campaigns have become more sophisticated over time, but the message has remained largely the same. Newfoundland and Labrador is a place frozen in time where tourists can get away from it all. Much is made of the province's rich heritage, picturesque fishing villages, and majestic scenery. It stands in contrast to the mass tourism provided by resorts, theme parks, and cruise ships. It claims to offer visitors a unique and more authentic experience. However, one criticism of tourism campaigns is that they romanticize and depoliticize Newfoundland and Labrador society. Since the 1890s, local residents have often been portrayed as happy, generous, proud, and independent. Class conflicts and social problems are swept aside. At the same time, the industry has done much to revitalize rural economies. This was especially true after the Cod Moratorium in 1992. By the end of that decade, tourism had replaced the fishery as the economic base in some outport communities. <laughs> <laughs>